view is because there are too many requests. If you have an application where you have many, 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 many requests and you have to handle them, um, threading could be a big um, a problem or you have to cluster yourself, things like that. But if you have just a small application but with big amount of requests, why should you do such, uh, use such a big framework like that? So, um, and on the other side, Vertex is very good on other, other topics. Uh, but I don't want to get so much into just want to tell some small things about me. I'm principal consultant of Codecentric AG in Stuttgart in Germany. I'm just one month ago, I um, had been hired there to start up a new location in Stuttgart. We normally do consultings in, I would say, sometimes groovy stuff, sometimes not so groovy stuff, but most technically on the Java, Java VM or Java-based techniques. Myself, I've I've committed myself to Groovy, um, using it very much, and I come from the field of, normally from the user experience and user interface area, working much with JavaFX in nowadays. And I'm a Griffin committer to guess, together with Andres Almere, or he is the most one, and I try where I can, or when I can. First of all, a question to you. Who does not know what Vertex is? Good. And who has already worked with Vertex? Just a few of you. I don't want to get so deep into that, just like a brief introduction. But Vertex, you can say, is just a framework for, to write polyglot, highly concurrent applications. It's not just for the web thing, but as well for um, client-server logic, where you have many requests, many requests at the same or small time span, um, and it's a good framework as well if it's not so much high traffic, but as well if you want to program a polyglot application. So you have multiple languages, Java, Groovy, Ruby, um, JavaScript, don't know who loves JavaScript, but Maybe there's some in there in this, in this room. Um, architecturally, it's a bit like Node.js. There had been a, big, you know, a bit of hype some time ago about Node.js and um, Vertex on the base. You can think about it's a Node.js and virtual machine on Java base. It's using an asynchronous non-blocking API. So you have to think about that you just tell the framework to do something, and if you're finished, then do this. So it's a reactive programming, it's called, or event-driven development. And as I said before, it's polyglot, currently supporting mostly Java, JavaScript, Groovy, Ruby, Python, and some others, Scala as well as I think so far. Sorry. A small overview of the architecture, just that you have a feeling for what to do. If there's a, a, a request from a client, if it is a web client or a FAT client or any kind of tri uh, client, normally connecting to your Vertex application, um, it will received in a piece of code, I would say, or sent from a uh, received from a framework and sent to you in a piece of code called a vertical. Verticals are the, the parts of code of your application that you actively write where you do something. You have two types of them, normal verticals and worker verticals. The difference is that worker verticals um, are running in a background thread and maybe run on different machines if you want to. And they are allowed to block. They ha can have blocking things like reading files from the directory or uh, have long calculations or anything that takes a longer time than just a few milliseconds. But the verticals, they are designed to just to be short and fast. Each action that you do in a vertical just had to be started and finished. And if you have a long running thing, you either use API that's already there or you delegate it to a worker. 
um, send it over an event bus. This is the, this is the communication model or communication path between the verticals and worker verticals. Um, you send an event, hey, please do that, and you just set, add a callback, and this is called when the answer comes back. F um, so this is a bit different to Node.js, where Node.js is just only based on this event loop. Uh, Node.js has no um, background thread. As far as I know, maybe they already have, but as far as I know, they don't. And additionally, if you're using Firefox or any other web browser, um, you have the chance to, as well, access directly to the event bus and send events directly from the client, if you want to or need to, and receive as well. On top of Vertex, I often use a framework that's called Joke, or Yoke, or how you want to pronounce it. It's a small middleware framework based on Vertex, and it's just adding some um, some useful helpers, useful functionality. So if you into using a, a or creating a Vertex application, just have a look to Joke, maybe it's something for you. Um, it currently only supports Java, JavaScript, and Groovy. Maybe more in, in the future, but for my purpose, that's totally enough what I need. <laughs> what Joke is delivering is things like a static file serving, what you normally would expect from a normal static web server, or um, a request body parser to parse uh, form parameters or any stuff, or a cookie parser where you can read cookies so you can easy, easily handle cookies in your application. A request router we will see later on as well for um, modularizing your application. Normal Vertex application just has a single point of entry and all the other stuff you have to do yourself. With this you can separate it in different modules, different parts, uh, based on the URL of the incoming. Um, request. Other stuff like virt virtual hosting support and template engines that you can, can create server-side um, content. Mostly Vertex is used, or most uses I saw in the past, is um, that you create an application based on a JavaScript client connecting to the Vertex server and just getting results. So. From my point of view, just that's all to theorat uh, theory. I just want to have some code to show you. For that, I just make a simple example path that we use. It's just a use case. We want to use, uh, we want to calculate a list of CSE32 um, codes, uh, numbers, calculations, for all the files in a directory recursively. So, what do we have to do? First of all, we have to read all the entries in the directory. If we have all the entries, we just we have to read the property for each file, file properties, to detect if it's a directory or not. So do we have to recursively step into or not? So if it's a directory, do it recursively. If not, read the file and send it over the bus to a worker vertical to calculate the CSC32. That is all the use case we or I want to talk about, but there are some things we can see that about, it, about that. Um, I hope from size of code you can see anything later on, I have to admit, will be, be a bit smaller, but we'll see. Um, this is what such a, such a code on a classical vertex or joke code that you could um, develop would look like. First of all, I would deploy the worker, um, the verticals just say, okay, add this um, vertical, let it run a background thread. The code we'll see later on. Then I start this router. I have a joke, introduce this router, request router, just instantiate it and add a get method. So if it's a get action and the URL is slash CRC, then please do this closure in here. Um, what I do here is Later on, I'll explain why, but um, I say go to chunked mode. That means that if something is sent over the 
um, of the HTTP connection that the connection will be held and not closed for that until it will be closed. Then contact and content types, just plain text for this example, and then um, call a method we will see later, or call a closure like that. So and just for slash, just render a, um, a static file. Don't want to go into, into that, just want to see, I want you to see that. So next thing is just get a joke reference. New uh, instance of joke. And there I register things. First of all, I said, later on I want to use some templates. I use the template functionality, so I have to register a template engine. There are multiples there. The Groovy template engine is just using, or is using simple template engine from Groovy. Um, it is relatively easy to use other template engines. Uh, maybe the markup template en engine for future. It's not out of the box, but it's very simple. It's just 20 lines of code in a class and just register it here and you're gone. Um, and then with the use, it's just you add these functionalities called these, uh, these middleware functionalities. And each request is just thrown into this chain of middleware, first of all, uh, handled by the first one, and the result will handle by the next one, and so on. So what we add here is the first is the router, the router that we prepared before. So first of all, do something based on the URL or on the request. If that is not, or th this is not handled in this, in, this, um, in this router, then we just add a static web file serving. There suggests this is a timeout of about 24 hours for caching files, just the web directory down there, what we do here. And the thing is just a fallback. If it's not found, just send a, f send a 404 error message back to the client that it can be shown. And then, last but not least, start the web server. Listen on the port 8080 in this case. So this is no magic, just normal joke or vertex code. So I'm not sure if you can read it. Uh, maybe. It doesn't matter, you don't have to read it. <laughs> uh, we will see this code more often and I will pick out snippets of that and we see that more directly. But I want you to see it all over, this, uh, over the way, or all in once. Um, just what we see, first is I do fs read here, this is where I read the directory, later on I do fs props, this is where I read the file properties. Um, then I, it before that I iterate over, over the path that I got. Uh, later on um, I go into CRC, um, if it's a directory, so I recursively call the same method again. If it's a di directory, otherwise I read the file, I send it over the bus to the worker and handle the, um, the request. So, but before we can start, just some experiences from, from the build side. Um, Vertex is preparing a nice template for creating um, you know, your Vertex pro uh, projects. Um, if you want to use joke, you have to add some thing simple things, like into the build gradle add just a, another dependency um, to the joke version. version. Um, if you use joke, if not, you don't need to. And um, current version 2.1 came out, I think, on last Wednesday. And there's a little bug in there in the template. You have to enhance or change the Groovy version to 2.2.1. Um, this is the Groovy version we really need for many of these use cases here we still later, see later. Okay, and just add the joke works version that it can be used in the dependency up there. Um, another thing is that I struggled some time because Gradle, current Gradle versions, is still running on 1.8.6 version, uh, Groovy. 1.8.6 is a bit outdated for some of the features that I want to use. And there is a run mod um, task to run your Vertex application. That's very handy normally that you just can use the Gradle to run your Vertex application. But the problem is, 
you have to live with 186 for Groovy version. So um, I struggled a bit to find a solution or to find the problem, and after that, the solution had been easy. What you have to do is just, I just made an own task, additional task, where I run the Java exec. So I call a new virtual machine. I think Jorge as well had um, a similar problem. Maybe this would be the same fix for him. Um, so it just if you want to have a look, this is just the task that I have to add. And if you want to command out the JVM orgs, this is for remote debugging. So it's handy sometimes if you want to get into there. So let's get back to our code. This is the same code that we saw before. One thing I hope we see is that we have some repetition of code, mostly here. We have a repetition of, yeah, if there is an error, then hey, set the status code, set the status me message, and send it out to the client. These are just three lines in this simple case. Uh, in our practical case, we had as well added some logging. We had a logging into database and all other stuff. Uh, so th this took some time. It took some code, and you always had to repeat it. I don't like repeating code. I hope you as well not. And so the first thing to look about, or thought of thinking about to resolve these three line code to something that can you reuse or use more easily is using a method or closure selector. So what we do, just introduce a method called end. We give the response, the status code, and the status message. No big deal, set the code, set the message, and send it out to the end. Um, this could be used with end and the re response, or request.response, and so on, the arguments. But this is not so much, I would say, not so groovy from the, the um, from the line. What I wanted to have normally is something like I do a end method on the response directly. Request.response.end. So there are multiple ways that we could solve that. One of the ways, and this as well works with older versions, is Dynamics mix-ins. We could create a class. I call it joke extension, extension in this case add a static method, and the content is the same what we had. Uh, the first parameter, first argument has to be the type um, or the class where you want to inject or mix in this, um, this method to. So later on, we have a joke response, so request.jokeResponse.end, and then status code, status message. How do you use that in your Groovy script of your vertex? Somewhere in the beginning, just add joke response dot mix in and joke extension. After that, you can use this method, um, this extended or added mixed in method all over your Groovy code. Um, this is nice, nice, but I always have to think about where has all this stuff mixed in, and I have to think about to mix in. And this is an every Groovy script where I, where I have to handle that. Um, so, what we, with Vertex 2.1, we have two other po uh, possibilities. One of them are static mix ins. Static mix ins, the code for the mix in is almost the same, you just get rid of the static at the methods. And then, Vertex has, with 2.1, uh, has a new feature where you can um, add a file called con um, compilerconfiguration.groovy to your class path. And if it's found, it's used for modifying the, the Groovy compiler configuration. So what you can do here is just add compilation com customizers. For example, add in a AST transformation customizer with a mix-in, the AST transformation add mix-in for the class joke extension. And hopefully, if Vertex will upgrade to 2.3, we can do the same with traits that I think Cedric will agree would be a bit, bit more stable than a mix-in. But it works. And 
If you do that, you don't think about it after that, just everywhere use the dot and method on the, re on the response. The other way that you can do as well, not before 2.1, uh, and that is because 2.1 is the first vertex, view, um, vertex version you, that uses Groovy.2, uh, <laughs> 2.2, sorry, or 2.2.1 is the current version they use. Um, that is that you create a module extension that you enhance, like you all might know the groovy, groovy default methods, and you create your own module to create your own default methods. Um, from the code, just the same that we had before, just add the static again to the methods, and then create a file and inside of a jar later on in the meta inf directory dot their services and it had to be called org code host groovy runtime module e extension module and the content would look like that give a name give a version and you give a list of extension classes in this case just one if you have a list just separated with commas so you have multiple files that you can add there um, to create, normally you just can create a jar file, put it in the lib directory, and you're, going, uh, you're done. What I like to is use Gradle, so I just add the Maven local repository to the build script and add a, reposit uh, add a uh, dependency to this jar file. And on my other project where I create the module extension, I just make Gradle install, and then it's installing to the lo local model, uh, Maven repository, otherwise on the other side it just pulls out of there. Good. If we do, do this, this code might look like this. There we just have, you see it on the right side, we just have one line after the else, um, and it could be a bit more slim, more easy to use. For me it's not only that it's less lines of code as well as that in the normal development thing you don't have to think so much because I just if I want to send something out there with a status code and a message then I just do that and I don't have to think about the internal things that are the API that I have to do so another thing is what we, where we can look to is the bus communication um, what I noticed very fast is that you very often have, if you have multiple external modules, uh, worker, worker verticals, that you tend to have the same API to send messages between your vertical or the verticals and your workers. So it looks very similar. So multiple application, most of them have always the same kind of protocol. So why don't streamline that and make it a bit more easier to hide away these implementation details. Here, in our case, this is just zoomed in to this, um, to this bus send command to send it over the event bus. Here we can say we just see their implementation details. For example, here we have to know that I get a status message called error if it is an error or OK if it is not. If it's it's okay. Or other thing is here, where I say, okay, if it comes back, then I want to have to send a message together with a stack trace, an error message like that. Maybe I want to do other stuff as well, but for use this use case. And the third one is, I want to access the message if it's a success, and there I have to know that it's content uh, that's inside of the body. Yes, you normally get used to, but yeah, they could simplify the things if you want to. And on the other side of the worker module, this is what I didn't show you yet, it's the crc.groovy file we already had. There, you register a listener to the bus. There, register handle, create crc. Any messages with this, with this token, with this name will receive by this closure. And Later on, you can handle that. There, I just get the buffer. Buffer is a vertex class for transferring, I would say, kind of byte arrays. Um, 
and then create normal code for creating a CSU32 and send the result. Here as well, I have this protocol. Here I just give back a map with the status and the message. Message can be any object in this type, in this case, the, um, the CSC, uh, CSC code. Or in case of an exception, I send back a message, an uh, error status and an error message. Message and, a, um, and the error code in a stack trace. So I calculate it and put it there. So I want to standardize that a bit for this simple use case. I can say, okay, just shrink a bit. I want this to look like this later on. Later on, in my try case, I can want to say reply success, and I give just the result that I would send there, and I have a reply failure where I can add the message and an optional uh, throwable that I can um, send to the to the vertical. How would I add that? All this stuff can be used the same way, either by a dynamic, dynamic mix-ins, for example, if you're um, before 2.1 or as I normally, normally currently use module. So what I do, I added a new extension module or created a new extension module, message extension, have these magic strings, okay, an error, and I have this reply success. Reply success. Uh, based on the message object, the message object is the message that will send uh, by vertex will be sent and forth, will be received, and whatever the content is. So whatever I do, I uh, if I just send this map with status OK and otherwise the content. In the reply, in the in the, in the failure case, I do the similar, just that I have some calculations for the error message, get the error, uh, the stack trace, put it into the this map together with a message and send it back to the client. To streamline, make it a bit e more easier, I just add another messages like get stack trace, get error, and get message to the message object, object sorry, to get these um, parts inside of this map, just to hide away, completely hide away the internal, internal API or internal um, Usage, how I implemented it, implementation, so I can easily change it on, uh, change it later on. Um, so what I can do here on the caller side, this had been the, um, the one side, the the the, um, the CSC side, the worker side. Now on the caller side. I want to have it a bit similar. I want to simplify it that I just say result.message and result lock message that I, ha I don't have to create all oh, this lock message string again. This is well very, very similar. Ah, just one simplification is that I as well want to hide away this result body status equals error. I just want to say if result. If result, there we have the option to create a as boolean method. Or um, if we want to make it a bit similar to the async result that we normally get from normal vertex implementation functions, um, there is a is succeeded message. So I just created this here, where I check on this OK string. And otherwise, and as, as boolean is the same, it's just a delegate to is, succeed, is succeeded. And another message um, to add the log message. So no magic, just something to simplify. And as I just noted, the async result, if I don't want to think about it, if I send a message to my other verticals, or if I send a message, for example, to the file system to get some informations, I'm going to streamline these two APIs so I have the same API. I don't think, ah, I'm this, this, this case and this case. So I just add the same things or the missing things. Um, to the async result object, so the as boolean, the get stack trace, the get error, get message, and the get lock message. Implementation is almost the same. So, if I add this, this code might look like this. Down there, or on the upper right, you see, it's just now, um, if it's result, then write the message, otherwise, Send the, uh, write the error message. 
But the next thing is, when you look at it, is that you have this kind of V thing. This is just, I think, four levels deep, but um, you can understand if it's more complex, you get a more, more deeper chain of closures that are wrinkled into one another. Um, at some time, you have to scroll left and right to read. It's not so easy. And the other thing, what is well, as well is a bit strange, is this loop. Here we say path each. Um, I said I have chunk mode, so I can send just the next CSC that I found, send it out there to the client, but how do I detect when it is finished? When do I have all these, um, all these elements in the, in the collection iterated? Currently, it's very hard, but, um, hard to impossible to detect it here, so it's easier to think about more, a bit more functional. So what I added there is, I called it handle chains, or a system, a more functional thing. Um, to get rid of these stacked closures in from inside out, because it's difficult to read. As I said, from then normally you read from top to down. There you have to get used to reading from the inside, uh, the outside to the inside, or from left to right, and you have to scroll sometimes it's too long. And um, as well, if you are searching for a bug, it's very hard to find logical parts and how this stacks or how the, how the path of the continuation is. And as well, it's difficult to test because um, mocking with such closures that stack in one into another is very difficult. It would be much more easier if you have just a log logical thing that you could as well put somewhere else and test it separately and then use it here in a more sequential way. And for the loop problem is how do I detect the end of the loop? As I explained, um, there you can have another solution, or oh, there might be a solution. So, what I want to create is a API or methods. It's call, I call it chain, chain where I can just add some closures. These closures will be um, called, I would say, kind of sequentially each time. I, this closure gets another closure. Here it's called next. And when you're finished with your code inside of your closure, just call the next, then the next method will be called. So you have a chance to interrupt the chain if their exception occurs or things like that. You as well have the option to give arguments to the next methods, like this 10 in here. Um, and if you don't need to, you I don't have to call the next method, but then the chain ends at this point. Um, because, well, you can write in different um, flavors, I would say. One of them is just with the, uh, without round brackets, just the closure bracket uh, separated by, with comma. Otherwise, it's all around that you put some um, them round brackets again, and there for you as well have the possibility to add an argument for the first method in the chain, for example, the 10 in this case. Um, otherwise, it couldn't get in there so easily. This as well, you can get rid of the braces, as you might know. But what I like most is a bit kind of an undocumented syntax feature. This is the thing that you can get rid of the commas between closures if these closures are the last argument. Um, especially in this case, I find it a bit more logical because, okay, now I start a chain and then I have a closure, like a block, and if it's finished, I have the next block and then the next block. Um, from my point of view, it's a bit more um, logical thing to notate, but as far as I know, it's not officially um, I said wanted or designed, and it might vanish sometimes in future, but as long as it exists, I will use it, maybe use well. Um, 
And what I like in this case as well is that I can do the normal or more builder-like spe uh, um, specification for adding some parameters in the beginning. So chain, round brackets, and then the block of the, um, the closures or blocks. So if I write it in multiple lines, it would read much more like builder syntax in there. So how to implement that? Just add a new extension mo module in this case and add a static method chain, get the object, get the arguments and optional and the block of closures. Uh, because of the multitude of arguments, uh, I have two implementations for, to get all the uh, combinations. This is for chain with just one um, closure as argument or chain with an argument that's not a closure and no closures and chain with one argument and multiple closures. Um, all that I do here is just uh, look there, is there a, um, is the argument as well a closure? If so, then add it to the list of closures in here called actions and get rid of the argument. Um, otherwise, get to the real action. And the other one, the other case is for a chain without any arguments or chain with um, any uh, multiple arguments but no closures or multiple arg arguments including closures. There as well just do handling for the, these type. Um, so that in the end I get the same result that I get an iterator of actions or iterator of closures and a array of uh, or a list of arguments that might be coming. So in the real action is like this, that, where I take the next action, the next closure that should be called in these closure blocks. Um, if I have arguments for that, I carry them to this action. Um, and then I call this action, and as a last argument, I give another closure, um, a closure, this is later on, this is this next closure, that if it is called, all of the arguments will taken and call this underline chain method again to be called with this new argument from the last argument and taken with the next actions, the next iteration, uh, next action in this iterator. So the next block, the next block, the next block. So it's kind of functional um, chaining loop or chaining, closure chaining. And almost the same I'm doing with the, with the loop. The loop is for, for each or each method like that. Uh, I call it loop as well for lists, what I want to have, and for maps. So the same syntax thing with commas, without commas, as you like to. This is how it should, should look like. This is just as well um, calculating the, or um, that it works for arrays, for collections, and for maps. Just two methods for that. And there is the, the real action. As well, get an iterator with the, um, in this case, not uh, the, the content, so the list, or the map, or the array. And then the closure that should be called each time. And the closure that should be, the optional closure that should be called if all the iteration have been run through. So I have an endpoint of this chain, additional closure. This is the case what I have here in the last option there. I say loop, the first closure should be run always for each element and the, other, and the last one after the last iteration that I continue on. Um, Good, so what do I do? I just get the next element in my iterator. Um, and then if I still have another element, so it's not the last one, hadn't been the last one, then I prepare for the next iteration or next action, action that should be called. It's just the same method here, the loop method, with prepared um, arguments, carried arguments, that is the next iteration on next value, next element, or if not, then the next action is the last iteration or after the last iteration closure, or the next closure, 
and then just call it. If it's a map, call it with key and value. Um, if not, just with the element. And in the case of you, uh, in the case that you don't have any um, elements in there, so iterator gives false, then just call the next action. If we do this with our code, it looks a bit different. We still have some kind of stacking inside out, but not as deep. As we see here, for example, all these four coming blocks would be all inside out, but now they are just streamlined. Here I have a chain. Starting the chain first is read the file properties. Then the next thing is check if it's a, it's a directory. Next is read the file, and next is send it to the worker to calculate the CLC. Here it's very easy or easier to take out each of these closures into another file, into variables or wherever, um, or, as or implemented as methods, so that I can test it much more easy. And then just use the, um, use the variables or use the method pointers to these methods. And so you have a chance, much more easy, to create um, unit tests for each functional block. And you don't have to mock so much, because the only thing you have to mock is the next closure. And in a test, normally, you want to do that. And additionally, I have the chance now with this, with this next, uh, or this last, after last iteration block, is to do something when I'm finished. In this case, and the connection to the client. So request response dot and. This tells the connection handler to close the connection. And, it's, um, and the connection has been finished. Otherwise, your browser would spin endlessly until timeout. Or another option that I now have is using a template engine. If you were first before, I just had the chance, or to, without bigger thinking, I just took the result that I just calculated, put it into a string, and sent it to the client. Uh, but if I want to put it into more fancy stuff, want to create offline or want to create server created pages, things like that, a template engine would be would be uh, nice. And what I did there is just adding um, that I can in this end block in this last where I just did the end there as well and can access the um, the template engine. One problem of that is that joke is a bit short-sighted from my point of view, but in this use case, because there is no real possibility to add the context, the web context. You can just do a put and a get, but you cannot read something in there, and you cannot get the whole context out to put it into um, somewhere else. So what I did here in this case is we need that. As well, we have on this render function to start the template engine, we don't have the option to add a context that we could fill or do something like that. Or at least I didn't see it in this time. Um, so what I did is a bit of a hack. And I just added another module where I added a get context method to access the private field of context. I know this is something normally we shouldn't do, but yourself know maybe in projects that don't have the time to wait for uh, to send a request to the open source project to wait for a fix on a new release or something like that. So we as well have the chance to use Groovy to do some hacks like that. Here I have to use a reflection because um, we use with a G joke request which is a child of joke request and the context is a private field of, of joke request, and I didn't find a way directly way with Groovy to access this two-level deep private field, but it worked with reflection. The same for request and response. So I can get hold of the, of, of the context object. Next thing is I get have um, have to add this random method to. Um, get random method to uh, the context of the random method, method, everything that I do is just save the context, clear it, put my stuff in, 
run the render engine, then clear it again and fill the old stuff back in. That's not nice, but sometimes you have to do hacker things. There's the template, a bit short of time, I'm just hurrying up. And another thing that you can do, just as, it's, as something useful, is now you can use base script classes. Custom base script classes um, with two ways, something like here to make things like simpler, simpler access. Uh, but as well, starting from 2.1, because either the, you would use the, uh, use the feature of compile configuration, they could set the config script base class, or the other way um, is with the base script annotation. The problem it's part of 2.2, and 2.2, the first Vertex uh, version with 2.2 Groovy is 2.1, is Vertex 2.1. Um, I normally use both, beca both because in IntelliJ the add base script is um, then I have um, source code completion. It works better than this, this uh, base script class. And all this stuff is if you get hold of the, my, um, uh, my slides, just something to read about there. It's, I as well added some things like simplifying um, or a wrapper upon Top of, on top of the MongoDB adapter from Vertex. Um, to simplify that, I don't have to know of all the stuff, so I can do access there with a general version and then save, update, delete, and all this stuff to make life a bit simpl more simpler. I added that to the base script class, but there are multiple um, thing, uh, ways that you could do that, add it to other, option, uh, other classes as methods. So, I hope that I could give you some hints what you could, you could help yourself with and simplify things and just ask you if there's some, ask, some questions, feel free. So then, thank you very much. I hope you enjoyed and have a nice Groovy Conference.